You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to try to experimentally find the value of Planck's constant. Now before we begin our experiment, we should talk a little bit about what Planck's constant is for those of you who don't know. So one of the major problems in physics in the late 1800s was that of black body radiation. Essentially, black body radiation is the energy given off by an object when I hold it at a given temperature. Because it's important to remember that temperature is really just the underlying kinetic energy of all the atoms and molecules beneath, and as they move around, so as a charge accelerates, it actually dissipates away some of its energy as radiation to slow back down. So experimentally, they measured this black body radiation curve here, which looks like a bell curve slightly skewed off to the side. But the problem was that no one could really quantize it in a nice mathematical way. The reason that this couldn't be quantized is because the photon was treated as something with infinite energy states, meaning that anywhere in between two numbers you could emit a photon with a median energy and it would still satisfy everything. However, it actually turns out that photons are quantized. And so Max Planck looked at the experimental data and then solved out for a given constant that would then satisfy everything. However, Planck himself viewed this quantization as nothing more than a mathematical quark. It wasn't more until 10 years later when Einstein showed that Philip Leonard's experiment with the photoelectric effect could be perfectly described with his quantization of light. In short, Planck's constant is the quantization of light. It shows that light is not just a linear path, rather it is like a staircase. You cannot have a photon existing in an in-between energy level, it has to go up by the level of a Planck constant each time. So this constant is very significant in modern physics because it turns out so many things are derived from this quantization and it definitely applies to the fabric of reality that we live within. So for today's experiment, we're going to be measuring this. To accomplish this, we're going to be using an LED's activation energy. This essentially means that at a given voltage, it will start emitting photons. We want to find that voltage to as close as the activation as we can. And then, since the voltage is in fact a measure of the energy of the system in joules per charge, we can take that voltage and times it by the charge of an electron, since that is our charge carrier, and that should give us the energy in joules. And using the energy in joules, we should be able to find a pretty close value to what Planck's constant should be, as it should be the quantization of the energy given per frequency of photon. Now this means we have to know two things about the LEDs we use. One, we have to know the activation energy, and two, we have to know the wavelength of the light emitted. In order to find the wavelength, we're going to be using a diffraction grating. The process of diffraction is the way that light seems to bend around angles. And in fact, it is dependent upon the frequency and the size of the slits that the light passes through that we get different placements of where the light goes onto. So for instance, here I have a diffraction grating. Now although you can't see it just by looking at it, this is really plenty of very, very small slits in all of this screen that causes the light to diffract around it. And so if I hold this up to the camera, and if I shine a light into it, you can start to see that rainbow. And that's because, given on the frequency of the light passing through it, it will cause the light to bend slightly differently, causing us to get to that nice rainbow curve. So if we put a single wavelength of light through this, we'll find that it will actually go in discrete angles with different intensities. And so, using this and using the LED projecting through it, we should be able to measure the distance between the slits and then empirically calculate out what the wavelength of the light is. However, one important thing for this is to know the distance between the slits and the diffraction grating, which I have no idea what this is. So we're going to try and measure that with a laser that I have that I know is 405 nanometers. And so shining that through this, we should be able to measure the angle that it is put off by, and then we should be able to calculate the distance between the slits on this screen here. Okay, so here I have the measurement set up. As you can see, I have the 405 nanometer laser right here, I have the diffraction grating right here, and here you can see the primary dot, which is the one directly in front of the laser, but off to the side you can see two other dots. These dots are the first diffractions from this diffraction grating. So by measuring the distance from the first node here, and then measuring the distance to the diffraction plating, we should be able to find the angle, and from that we should be able to derive the distance between the lines in this diffraction plate for the rest of our experiment. So according to my calipers, this turns out to be 84.3 millimeters. And just to verify, that does in fact line up with the exact same distance on this other side here. And the measurement from the diffraction grating to the screen turned out to be around 429.2 millimeters. Now with that figured out, we can apply the diffraction formula, which states that d sine theta is going to be equal to m lambda. 
Within this equation, lambda stands for the wavelength of the light, m stands for the integer number of diffraction that we're looking at, so for instance on the screen just barely, m is going to be 1, theta here is going to be the angle between that integer number diffraction and the diffraction plating, and d is going to be the distance between the slits on the diffraction plate. So using this diagram, if we have our diffraction plate here, these are the distances in meters that we measured going out and down that the uh, first integer diffraction was. And this angle right here is going to be our theta. So using trigonometry, we know that the inverse tangent of the opposite over the adjacent, which in this case is going to be 0 0.0839 over 0.4292, is going to be equal to theta. So now plugging all these values into our equation, we find that the distance between the slits is equal to the diffraction fringe, which in this case was 1 away from the primary node, times the wavelength of the light, which is 405 nanometers, which is 405 times 10 to the negative 9th meters, and that needs to be divided by the sine of theta, which for us is the sine of the inverse tangent of 0 0.0834 divided by 0.4292 and we can go ahead and plug that into our calculator and see what that equals. So the value of the slits per meter will be the reciprocal of that, which gives you around 470,980 slits per meter. Now this means that we'd approximately have 471 slits per millimeter. Now I know that commercially, a lot of these products are made to be around 500 slits per millimeter, and then some are made to be 1,000 slits per millimeter, but not really this oddball number. And so I assume that our actual slits per millimeter is going to be 500. Now you may wonder where the inaccuracy comes from, and I would likely assume it to be this 405 times 10 to the negative 9th, because my laser actually says that depending on operating conditions, it'll range anywhere from 400 nanometers to 450 nanometers. But this does put us in the relative ballpark, where now I can say this is likely going to be one of the 500 slits per millimeter diffraction gratings. Okay, so now I'm going to be measuring the activation voltage for each of the three colors, red, green, and blue. How I'm going to be doing this is that I have power supply supplying around 2.3 volts into this circuit, since I know it's somewhere a little bit beneath 2.3 volts. But I have that going to this potentiometer here, and that potentiometer goes to this LED, which I'm measuring the voltage across, so when I turn the potentiometer, it will change the voltage drop across this LED, and effectively, I can find the point right when it will start to make a little bit of flashes, and stop it there, and then record the voltage on this multimeter. Although I've been trying, the brightness of the LED is so low that the camera can't pick it up at all, so the footage just looks completely black. So I'm just going to go ahead and write down the measured values that I obtain, um, using this method that I've showed you, and then we'll go ahead and move on to the next step. Okay, so I finished measuring the voltage drops at the LEDs, but I actually was also able to get more precise lasers. And so here I have two lasers. This one right here is a 405 nanometer laser, and as you can see it's more clear than the last one. And so I got the measurements from that, and then here is a 532 nanometer laser. And as you can see, it's this green one here, and I got the measurements from that to more try to calculate out the diffraction grading to make sure it was actually around 500. And with this blue one, I ended up calculating around it to be uh, 497 um, slits per millimeter. And with this green one, I was able to calculate it to be around 498 slits per millimeter. And so I'm fairly certain uh, that it is actually 500 slits per millimeter now. Um, but another cool thing is that now with these two colors, if I line them atop of each other, you can see how the uh, nodes are actually going the different distances just as the formula says because the lower wavelengths will have a shorter or a smaller and the higher wavelengths are diffracted a little bit more and you can definitely see that from the green being bent more than the uh, violet is. Now to measure the wavelengths of each of the LEDs I built this little apparatus here. Now all this apparatus is is that I got a cup and then I wrapped it in electrical tape. The electrical tape is to prevent the uh, light from seeping through the cup as just because it makes it brighter and it's very hard to see some of the spectral lines and especially for it picking up on camera so we need it to be as dark as possible. But you can also see that I have a small slit here and that slit is then pushing the light through it to form just a bar basically going through the diffraction grating. And this is very important which I will show you guys now why. Now to further demonstrate to you guys why we need a slit of light going into the diffraction grating, I have this white LED here. So as you can see, uh, white is actually a component of all the colors, and so if I put it in front of the diffraction grating, you can see that not much actually happens. And in fact, it's only if I bring it to these slight edges that you can see a little bit of colors coming through next to the shadow. 
However, now watch as I put it into our apparatus here so it becomes a slit of light going into the diffraction grating. You can start to see those nice rainbow diffraction patterns formed. Now, actually looking at the camera, it's quite dim, but in real life it's pretty vivid colors going throughout here for the rainbow. So, we'll see how well it picks up the rest of these colors. Alright, so here's red. Now it looks like on the camera that you guys can't see any other integer node besides the very center zeroth one, um, but I can see them with my eye. So, I'm going to go ahead and take that measurement, just so you guys know, it looks like they're about, probably, 18 millimeters from the center. Now, of course, it's just an eyeball, I have no measurement for it yet. Um, but if you notice, in the center, that there's kind of a diffraction pattern going along with just the center node, that's actually just because I think within the cup it's reflecting back and around, and going back through it, and so that is the, uh, side ones you see. But I will just be measuring from the center brightest one because that is the primary node that I'm going to be using for the other ones. Okay, so now using this formula from all that data we took, which can be found here, uh, these are the distances from uh, the integer 1 node on the left hand side to the integer 1 node on the right hand side, so this is 2 times y, so that's why up here I have 0.5 times, oh that should be 2y up there, so let's just have that be y, but it would be uh, 0.5 times these measurements right here, so this is double that. Um, and then here are the activation voltages for each of them, so red, orange, green, blue. Um, here is the distance per slit, which is 1 millimeter divided by 500. Um, here is the distance away it was from the screen, and so using those, I was able to calculate out that the wavelength of the red light was 572.2 nanometers, orange was this, green was this, and blue was this. So, now that we have the wavelength and we have the voltage, we can try to set up an equation to find the energy. So since we are trying to find energy in a useful conversion factor of joules, um, it is useful to know that voltage is equal to the energy in joules divided by the charge in uh, coulombs. And so, here the charge carrier is the electron, and so we'll be using the charge of the electron for this charge down here. Now another thing we know is that the conversion from this energy to the photons emitted will not be 100% efficient. In fact, there is some work function that is needed to excite the uh, electron in a certain way to make the energy of the photon go off. So, for that work function, we're just going to be using the symbol psi. So since we know that energy is equal to h times f, where h is Planck's constant and f is the frequency of the photon, that implies that energy is equal to h times c over lambda, because c over lambda is equal to frequency. But since we also have that work function, we're just going to add plus psi for the energy lost that is not converted directly into the photon. So this side right here, that is the energy of the photon, and this side right here, that's just the work. So now to get our energy over here, we simply take the voltage times the charge of the electron, and then that can be equal to our hc over lambda plus the work function. Now, to make it easier on myself, I'm going to be saying that the function is going to be voltage is equal to hc over the charge of the electron times 1 over lambda plus work function divided by charge of the electron. So I was just dividing that charge of the electron from both sides so I get this side as just voltage. So now, although we do not know the work function for each individual LED, I can make the assumption that each LED has about the same work function, and then we can plot out a graph using this. So by plotting this all out on a graph, we can take the least squares regression line, which you can do using linear algebra by hand, but in this video I'm just going to be using a computer because that's much easier. Um, but yes, once we get that least squares regression line, the slope of that should be equal to about hc over the charge of an electron. So if we set that equal to it, then we can solve out that h will equal m, which is our slope. Oh, but I used m up there, so I'm actually going to use a different thing here. We'll just say s for slope. Yes, h will equal s for slope times the charge of an electron divided by the speed of light. So as you can see, here I have it all plotted out, so for the x side I have the inverse lambda, which is just 1 over each of the wavelengths of each of the uh, LEDs that I measured, and then I have the activation voltages I measured on the uh, y scale, and then the dots plotted out are right there, and then in Desmos I made it do a least squares regression, and it looks like our slope is this number down here. So our slope is about 0 .00000 
one, two, three, one, four. And really, I only have about three digits of precision, so I'm only going to be using about three. Or at least I'll use all these numbers, but then at the end we'll know that it's really uh, only precise to about three digits, plus or minus probably five or something like that, because my hand measurements aren't all that accurate. So now if you look here on this calculator, oh, you can kind of see those cool lines going on the screen. A uh, little bit of a tangent. If you look here on this calculator, we have m equal to the slope that we just calculated from our least squares regression. We have q equal to the charge of an electron. We have c equal to the speed of light. So therefore, our calculated value of Planck's constant is equal to that slope times the charge of an electron divided by the speed of light, which gives us a value of around 6.581 times 10 to the negative 34th. And this is very close to the real value, because the real value is 6.62607, about anyways, times 10 to the negative 34th. So if we take our value minus the real value divided by the real value to get our percent error, we only get a percent error of around 0.67%, which is very good accuracy for measuring by hand and with calipers. So yeah, this is quite a good experiment to try and uh, derive out what Planck's constant should be. So this video wasn't necessarily as flashy as my other ones, but Planck's constant is such an important value, especially it like defines all of modern physics. So I hope that you guys were at least tantalized by the video, and especially uh, you could perform this experiment at home. It's pretty fun, it's pretty easy to do, and gives you pretty good results if you're careful enough. So anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video and sticking around. I really hope I was able to teach you guys something in this video, but if not, I have plenty more experiments planned for the next few weeks, and so hopefully you guys will enjoy those. If you have a suggestion for a topic in physics you'd like to see, then go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and I'll try to get back to you and create a video that will well explain it. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit that thumbs up button as it really helps the channel. But yeah, that is all I have for you guys this week, so please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode we're going to show you how to make your very own solar panel.